Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Welcome to church today. My name is Gavin Tate. I'm honored and privileged to be bringing you the word today. Did anybody come to meet with Jesus? Uh, very excited. Today, we are in our I Am series. We're on the second week. This is I Am a Servant. And I'm going to pray in just a moment that something really divine happens in you today. Something happens in your heart because extraordinary things come from servanthood. It is what Jesus did for us, and it is the example that he showed us of what leadership actually is. Let me read this scripture to you, and then we're going to pray. It's my angel right there. Come on. Thank you, Jose. God bless. The angel just flew away. Flew away. He might come back. I hope not, but praise God. Acts chapter 6, 1 through 8. Let's read the Bible. How many of you are interested in the Bible? Come on. That's what we should be reading. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings and discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should not spend our time teaching the word of God and not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well respected, full of the spirit of wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. What responsibility? Waiting tables. We got to have people, they're saying, that are full of the spirit of wisdom, not to preach, but to wait tables. Then he says, then we apostles can spend our time praying and teaching the word of God. Everyone liked this idea, so they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, to wait tables. Philip, to wait tables. Prochorus, Nicanor. Timon, I'm going to stop trying to read those names. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So please understand what's happening. They're calling a prayer meeting and laying hands on people to wait tables and pick up trash. <laughs> These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. Now listen to these words. Then the number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem. And many of the Jewish priests were converted to Stephen, who was one of them, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. Jesus, we love you. Help us, Lord, as we speak your word right now. We submit to you. Holy Spirit, I know you're here. Thank you for being inside of me. Thank you for leading us. God, this is a moment that could change somebody's life. I pray that you allow me to speak only what you want me to say. And just help me, Lord. I need your help. There are people in this building, Lord, that are in different places in their life. They need to hear you, Jesus. I'm asking Holy Spirit and I'm leaning on you. Would you help me? Help people to hear your voice, not mine today. I pray that something comes forth, God, that people can feel you strong. People want you, Jesus. They need you. Show up the way that you always do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so we're in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts, as we know it in the modern day church, or we should know it, is the picture of the church God always saw. The picture of what church should be like. It is still... An entire item list. If you literally go through the book of Acts, you can see how we're supposed to run children's ministry. You can see how we're supposed to be uh, giving as a church. You can see what it's like and how we're supposed to have connect groups or, or small groups or DGs in our homes. You can see when we need to come to the house of God. You can see people's dedication, the attitude of giving. You can literally see the blueprint for what God wants the church to be. Please understand that churches were already existent. Synagogues is what they called them back then, but they were church buildings. So Jesus was sent, the Bible said, in the fullness of time. The word fullness of time means the perfect timing. 
Jesus was not sent in any time but the perfect timing. And I just want you to know that still to this day, God always shows up in the perfect time. In every single one of your lives, you call out to him, but a lot of times we don't know what God knows, so we have to trust God's timing. It's an incredible lesson to learn as a Christian is trusting the timing of God. Heck, we would love to be married right now, but it might not be God's timing. We would love to, you know, be in a relationship right now, but it might not be God's timing. We would love to have our own business and have a million dollars right now. I don't think anybody would reject that. However, if you had it outside of God's timing, it would hurt you, not benefit you. So Jesus comes in the fullness of time, and it says he arrives perfectly on time, and he comes to teach the church, listen, how to be the church. He comes to teach the church how to actually be the church. And you know what Jesus is still trying to teach churches? How to actually be the church. Because see, even though the buildings were there, even though people were sitting in the seats, even though they were listening to the messages, something was missing. Jesus himself. You see, it's like going to a party. You have a birthday party and people are showing up for your party. It's your birthday. You arrive at your house and the, you can hear the music already bumping inside and you can see the lights flashing and people are all out in your yard and you're like, all these cars are parked on the street and you're like, dang, all these people are here for me? Wow, you already start feeling really special and you're like, man, I didn't even know it's a surprise party. I can't wait to get up into my house and, and have my party. But you walk up to the door and all of a sudden there's a man there and he's acting like a bouncer, you know, like at a club or something. And he's like, um, you can't come in unless you're on the list. And you're like, it's my house, man. You know, like they're here, they're celebrating me. You know, you see those songs. You see, yeah, you see, birthday, happy birthday, Gavin, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's me. That's me, by the way. I know I haven't met you, but it's my house, you know. What are you doing standing in front of my door? And he says, well, let me check on the list. You weren't invited. <laughs> whoa, 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 wait a second. Like, it's my house party. Like, they're singing about me, yo, 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 and everything. But you're not on the list. They actually didn't invite you, and if you think they're the one they're singing about, I don't know, but you're not invited into your own house. See, that's what church is like in a lot of America. See, we love Jesus. We love the idea of Jesus. We love speaking about Jesus. We're singing songs to Jesus. We're lifting our hands to Jesus. We're doing all the, the, the rituals of Christianity. We're saying, I'm blessed. Are you blessed? Yeah, I'm blessed. You blessed? We know how to speak it. We know how to put it on the face and everything. But when Jesus actually shows up to his house, he's not invited in the building. So, in other words, if you invite and you love Jesus, but you know how we dismiss him from the building? We don't love the Holy Ghost. Some people think they can separate the difference. They're like, well, I love Jesus, but Holy Spirit, eh, I don't know, because he's, he might get weird. I don't know, I've seen some crazy things. You know, eyes might roll in people's heads and people might be on the ground and foaming around and I've been in that and I don't want any part of that. Well, let me tell you something. If you don't want any part of the Holy Ghost, you don't want any part of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is Jesus unlimited. Don't you understand that when Jesus walked this earth, he walked in a body and you had to schedule a meeting with him? Don't you know that there were thousands of people that were rubbing up against him at all times, but only few people knew how to pull from him? Do you remember the issue of the woman with the issue of blood? It said that there are thousands of people touching him, but only one woman, it said, came and actually knew how to pull from him. You see, there are Christians all over the world. And we're all surrounding Jesus. We're all clapping. We're all fitting in with what it means to be a member of a church. And maybe some of us are even typing and doing what it is. But very few of us actually know how to pull from God because we're hungry, because we're submitted, because we actually are obeying what he's saying. And, and so Jesus is moving around and he's like, listen, I got to go and I got to send this person his name. It's a person. It's not an entity. It's not a cloud. It's not something. It's not a theory. It's not like a feeling. It is a person. His name is the Holy Ghost. Ghost. And when Jesus sent him, he'd send him to take his place. Do you know what that means? That means Jesus went up there and the Holy Ghost is down here. So in other words, he acts exactly like Jesus. He speaks exactly like Jesus. He does exactly what Jesus would have done. Don't you know Jesus wouldn't have done any of it if it hadn't have been the Holy Ghost who did it? Don't you know that even Jesus needed the help of the Holy Ghost? How do you think you don't need the help of the Holy Ghost if Jesus himself leaned and needed the help of the Holy Ghost? I mean, I don't know what we're doing here. And, but please, if you reject the Holy Spirit, you're rejecting Jesus on earth. 
So he has to come, and we're in this time, and this amazing thing happens in the book of Acts chapter 2, one of the greatest, the greatest uh, uh, event ever in church history. And it is when the Holy Spirit came off of the elevator, he pushed the button, he walks out of the doors, and he enters into 120 people, and he falls on them like tongues of fire. Can I just say as a side note, if you've seen pictures of this event and you saw the little flames on people's heads, that's not what happened. It wasn't little flames as of tongues of fire. Do you know why he wrote that as of tongues of fire? He wrote it because when he was seeing it, the Bible says that really what was happening was their entire body was wreathed in flame and they were shaking as they were singing and it looked like a tongue. It's a full baptism. Baptism means to be fully immersed. When the Holy Spirit comes, he doesn't just want your pinky. He doesn't just want your foot. He wants your entire life. He wants every area of you. He wants to fill you. He wants to be unhindered working through you. He wants to work through you to your wife. He wants to work through you on your business. He's wanting to be let out of the cage. So Jesus comes, this thing happens all of a sudden and people are getting the Holy Ghost. And from the moment the Holy Spirit shows up, stuff starts to happen that's never happened before. We see that Peter, literally the moment it happened, walks out on the steps and he begins to preach. Now Peter, the same Peter who denied Jesus three times because he was such a coward, because he was so scared, because he had no backbone, he denies Jesus three times. The moment the Holy Ghost touches him, the man who was a coward steps out onto the steps and is preaching so boldly that over 2,000 people get saved in the streets and then Peter walks off and not only that Peter doesn't just preach now get this guys his shadow is healing people because when the Holy Ghost comes upon him he knows I don't want to grieve this spirit I don't want to hurt this spirit I want to be sensitive to the spirit you see when you're sensitive to what is on you when you realize what is upon you when you realize what's come upon you even your shadow the moment you step into a scenario things begin to shift not because you're special not because you had great makeup not because your hair is amazing today not because you have 50 thousand likes on Instagram but because you're looking more like Jesus can I just give you something real quick for every person in the building you always say, I have people ask me all over the world Gavin what is God doing in my life right now I didn't even know what the Lord's doing I can tell all of you confidently this he's making you like Jesus that's what he's trying to do he's trying to make you like Jesus he's trying to change you to become more like Jesus I can say that without prophecy I can see that without a word of knowledge why because the Bible says when the Holy Spirit came he is trying to make you into one image the image of Jesus it says he did not come for himself he doesn't even speak of himself but the Bible says that Jesus said he will come and remind you of my words he will come and speak of who I am he will come and tell you of me he'll bring glory to my name you see the Holy Spirit is so generous He's the most powerful entity, the most powerful being, the most powerful person ever. However, he doesn't ever claim any credit for himself. He points you to Jesus. He's trying to make you like Jesus. Why is he trying to do that? Because Jesus was the most unhindered vessel the Holy Spirit had ever been upon. Jesus, when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, the Bible said he remained. Jesus never did anything to grieve the Holy Ghost. Jesus never did anything that the Holy Spirit would have to leave. Jesus never did one thing that made the Holy Spirit reconsider what he'd done. It said the moment he came on Jesus, you know why? Because the Holy Spirit is attracted to Jesus. He's attracted to the way Jesus talks. He's attracted to the way Jesus walks. He's attracted to the way that Jesus does things, how he sits down, how he gets up. He's attracted to Jesus, so he's trying to get you to look more like Jesus so that he can flow as unhindered as he did in Jesus himself don't you understand the more like Jesus you allow areas of your life to become the more unhindered the Holy Ghost becomes in your life and please understand if you want to do something for God if you want to do something great greatness does not come by getting more followers greatness does not come by getting more money greatness does not come true greatness by having a greater name by winning a championship you can hold up all the trophies you want you know what those trophies are gonna go when you're at the judgment seat of Christ in the fire greatness to God is being like Jesus acting like Jesus doing what Jesus did greatness is the question it's the question I'm asking today is what do you really think greatness is 
Do you want to be great? All of us love greatness. My gosh, we're, we're about to watch the Super Bowl today. You know what's going to happen at this game tonight? Two people are going to go at it. They're going to clash heads, maybe a concussion or two. They're going to sacrifice their bodies. We're going to be eating our nachos and our cheese things. We're going to be, oh, we're going to be rooting. And there's going to be people over here. And, and we're going to act like we're enemies for one night because it's fun, you know, because we're two different teams. But we really love each other. But we're going to act like it, ah, you know, and just the whole thing. And then the whole night's going to end and somebody's going to hold up the trophy. And there's going to be thousands of people filling a seat stadium that are worshiping the people holding up a trophy. And God's going to be sitting in heaven. And you know what he's going to be doing? He's going to be in China right now saving people all over the world. He's going to be over here. He's going to be saving people there. He's going to be bringing a single mother up from nothing. And he's going to be rescuing her. Angels are on the way to Afghanistan right now. And they're saving Christians who are giving their life for the gospel. Angels are being sent to China right now with people underground. You know why? Because that's what Jesus sees as great, building his kingdom. We can shout for other people and we can help build their kingdoms. But honestly, what is God seeing as great? If you see tonight and you look at that and you think that's great, you have a very misconceived idea. Because when you get to heaven, God does not ask how many rings you got. He asked this, how many people that were ugly did you make beautiful? He asked this, how many souls that were lost did you bring with you? He asked this, how many sacrifices did you give of yourself? Was your body a living sacrifice given holy and pleasing for God? So they come to this predicament, all these apostles, and they're there, and it says Peter calls them together, and they're having an issue because people need to be fed. It's not spiritual anymore. There's these women, and they're just hungry, all these widows, and they need some food. So he says, man, what are we going to do? So it says they call a prayer meeting and they anoint people to serve tables. They anoint them. They lay their hands. They say, this is a big deal. This is something we got to serve because don't you know that the only way to find your destiny in God is by serving his bride? You see, people are forgetting. You're wanting to skip the service. You see, I think about Elisha. Elisha was this man that we all know about. He was pretty incredible. Let me just tell you a couple things that he did. Bible says that when the double portion came down from Elijah and the mantle came down, look what happened. It said the moment it touched him, he took this mantle and he hit the water of the river and the river literally stood up on both sides and he walked through on dry ground as the water's on his right and the water's on his left. That's pretty cool. But then he walks from there and he goes into the city. They can't drink the water that's in the city. So he says, give me a little bit of salt. So he takes a handful of salt, he throws it into the water and the entire city now can drink from the water because this one man took some salt and threw it in the water. You wouldn't have thought it was significant, but it actually changed the water, so now it's drinkable. He walks from there. He's got a bald head, so these kids like, felt like they wanted to make fun of him, these teenagers. So he's walking, and they literally look, and they go, oh, baldy, 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 and they're making fun of him. And he sends out bears, and the bears eat all of these teenagers. This is in the Bible. It's literally in the Bible because he didn't want to be made fun of. This man had such an anointing that he walks from there, and these bears literally eating these kids... And he walks over the next pot, and there's a woman that he sent to. This woman has nothing. She's about to eat her last meal. She's making a fire, trying to survive to make her last meal for her and her son. And the Bible says he shows up, and he says, why don't you make me a meal first? God has sent me to you. And the woman's like, are you crazy? I'm literally about to die. We're in a famine. He said, no, no, no. He said, if you'll make me a meal, what will happen is you'll never run out of oil. You'll never run out of food for the rest of your life. And she happens to believe him. I don't know why she believes him. I wouldn't have believed him. I'm hungry. I want my last pancake. I ain't going to give it to you. That's what I would have done. So I'm sitting here and it's just like, what do you do? So he literally, she makes him the meal and it says that the oil literally never ran out. She would finish it and it would fill back up. She finished it and it filled back up. This guy was pretty cool. He's so cool that he literally could sit on his porch one day and he's drinking his drinking his tea and over 120,000 Syrian soldiers surround his house. They're coming to take him. And it says his servant Gehazi, who's sitting with him, is freaking out. But he pops open his little, uh, you know, mojo. And he's like, oh, I can't wait to see what God's about to do. This guy was crazy. He literally was nuts. And he literally prays this prayer. He says, God, if you would just open this man's eyes and let him see. And all of a sudden, the servant's eyes are open. And he sees over 200,000 angel hosts that are also surrounding him. Now, listen what happened. This is crazy. This is all within like a week, y'all. A week of this man's life. And so he's sitting there, and then he says this, God, just blind them all. And over 120,000 men who were coming to kill him are now walking around like this. Ah, ah, 
Ah. You see, because when God's on your side, the things that meant to kill you and harm you are gonna be embarrassed, embarrassed, embarrassed. I don't wanna preach that. So it says that he goes out in front of him. This is so hilarious, but it's in the Bible. I promise I'm not making this up. He goes out in front of him and he says, you guys follow me because they can't see anything. And he's like, I'm going to take you to a good place. They don't even know that it's Elisha. They're just hearing this man and let's follow him. So you got to imagine 120,000 soldiers. <laughs> follow him into a city. The king of that city calls down to Elisha and says, should I kill all these people? They're right in front. Look, they're us. We should just take them. And Elisha says, nah. Don't kill him today. Just feed him a meal. Let's put, cook him a banquet and send him home. So he says, you're not blinded anymore. And they're not blind. They open up their eyes. Oh, my God. They eat a meal, and then they leave. And the Bible says they never come back to that area ever again. I don't know about y'all, but I wouldn't come back neither. Because of one anointed man, over 120,000 men with swords are intimidated. Because of one anointed man... Y'all, we're making a big deal of it that, oh man, what an incredible word. And, wow, it's so incredible that we have 200 people in our church. And wow, we had another that. Like, listen, I want to celebrate with you as well. But listen, y'all, it's not about more members. This man, do you, when you read in the Bible, you see what was actually happening in the Bible? We have a ways to go, y'all. We have a ways to go when it comes to the anointing. We're celebrating like, hey man, uh, did you like how great I preached? Did you like my new shoes today? By the way, I was given these. This is pretty cool, by the way. So anyway, but now that's not what it's about. This man is blinding 120,000 people with the stroke of his hand. What are we celebrating? What do we actually think power is? Is power really my headache is gone? Is that really what Jesus came just for your headache to be gone? Yeah, if you have serious headaches, of course he wants it to be gone. But Jesus came to change lives. He came to transform souls. He came to shift churches. He came to shift cities. So he tells them one man. Now, he goes from there. This is so incredible. And on his way home, he meets this woman. This woman uh, has been wanting to have a child, and she can't get pregnant. So he finally comes and says, what's wrong? Uh, you're really special. I think there's something about you. Let me give you, I think God has a word for you. What do you need? And she said, I've always wanted to have a kid, but she could hardly even say it. He said, well, you'll get pregnant next year. She said, don't you dare play with me. That's what she said. She said, don't you dare say that. Don't you play with me. If you play with my emotions, if you get me to believe this and it doesn't happen, I swear. She gets pregnant that very next year. She gets pregnant. Now that child later on, go down there, dies. She sends for Elisha. The man's like, oh, I got some time in my schedule. I got a couple hours, so I'm going to run over that direction. He comes and he lays on this boy, breathes mouth to mouth, nose to nose, eyes to eyes, and the boy wakes up from the dead. <laughs> now, all of you guys are clapping and everybody's shouting. Why? Because that sounds like greatness, doesn't it? But that's where you're wrong. We all love the fact that the dead will rise. God wants it. It's awesome. We all love the thing, but let me just pause and rewind six years. <laughs> Elisha, the same Elijah who just raised the dead six years earlier, is wearing a brace, and he's walking behind 12 yoke of oxen, stepping in their you-know-what as he's farming and tilling up the ground, serving. Serving. You see, everybody loves the raising of the dead. Everybody loves the fire coming down. Everybody loves because that seems like greatness, but nobody wants to go through the bull it takes to get there. Oh, Gavin, would you lay hands on me? I need a double portion of your anointing. If you could just lay hands on me, I need a double portion. Who have you ever served? besides yourself? That's my question. <laughs> Nobody knows that for six years, Elisha was serving this other man called Elijah, and it said that for six years, he's making meals for him. For six years, he's washing his underwear. For six years, he's folding his clothes. For six years, nobody knows who he is. Nobody's seeing him. He's making sure he's got meals to eat. He's making sure he gets a bath. He's bathing him sometimes. He has to. Uh, you don't understand, like, everybody wants the greatness. But do you want to do this? 
We have mothers who are in homes right now, moms, who are serving their families. And I just want to give you an encouraging word. I don't care if your family appreciates you, honestly. God sees what you're doing as you're serving your children, as you're serving your homes, as you're serving the people. Are you willing to wait the table? Because if you're not willing to serve at the table, you're not willing and ready for God to give you the anointing. I think about David. David got anointed by Samuel. This incredible experience. He's out in the field. What is he doing when he's out in the field? He's serving and he's writing poems to God. He's writing worship songs to God. He's singing to his father. He's loving on his God. He didn't know that all of those songs were going to become the book of Psalms that we would now millions upon billions of people read later in history. He didn't know that he had the best-selling list of songs ever made. He was just writing alone to his father. He was just spending time. Oh, God, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in one. He's by himself. He's just serving. He's just doing some. He's just shepherding sheep. And then he comes and gets anointed. Do you know that it was 50? 15 years from the time that he was anointed to the time that he took the throne. What was he doing for 15 years? Well, he was serving God with what he had. He was serving God with what he had. The Bible said he was two things. He was a shepherd and he was a musician. So what was he doing? He was serving God with his instrument. He went to a king named Saul and the Bible said he'd start to play and the demons would come off of the king. The demons would literally run when he'd start to play because as normal as your talent is, when it's placed in the hand of God, it becomes divine. Let me tell you again. As normal as your talent is, the moment it's placed into the hands of God it becomes divine so he's playing the harp and demons are running then that man is throwing spears at him for 15 years he's running for his life and he's serving and listen to this the entire time he never says a bad word about the man who's trying to kill him we literally have gossip parties at the church you get with all your girlfriends, you guys go out to lunch, and what do you do? Talk about your husbands the entire time. <laughs> we got our Super Bowl parties, all the men, we're gonna go have a sports day, what are we gonna do? Man, that woman, she's really wearing on me, guys. God's be praying for me. I need some help, man. That woman, she never lets me get out of the house. She never lets me come with the dudes anymore. Can I ask, why the heck do you want to be with the dudes now that you've got a woman? Mm. <laughs> Woo! Why? What are you talking about? I was so happy to be done being single when I got married. I'm like, oh, I don't need to see y'all brothers no more. God bless. Like, I had my dude time, you know what I'm saying? Anyway. We think about Stephen. Stephen is a man and Philip, the Bible says, were anointed to wait tables. The Bible says they were sent to wait the tables, but Stephen already had gifts going on in his life. The Bible says that Stephen's wisdom was incomprehensible. Nobody could measure up to his wisdom. Nobody could speak against him. If he would speak something, nobody could take him down. He was the best at apologetics. He could explain literally the entire Bible, Jesus from the book of Genesis, all the way to the end of when Jesus came, and he did it in one conversation in one chapter of the book of Acts. He literally takes the entire Sanhedrin body and takes them to school. This man was incredible, but the Bible says where did those miracles happen while he was waiting tables you see you don't understand that the reason why God said you must anoint men of wisdom to wait these tables is because God knew these people got to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost because while I'm serving a plate to somebody the Holy Ghost is gonna move and give me a word of knowledge for this mother while I'm serving a cup, and I'm just, I think I'm just spilling water, but you don't understand. God's going to use you, and in your hand, you set down the water, you pick up your hand. It's hot because healings just touched your hand, and you're going to lay hands on this woman's knee, and she's going to be, oh, my God. She thought she just came for a meal, but she came actually for an encounter with Jesus because she encountered you. You see, let me say it like this. We don't play around when it comes to serving. You, 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 there, ain't, there ain't no people who are just, I kinda, I'm just going to serve, see how this goes for a couple weeks. We don't need you. We need people who have wisdom. We need people who have insight. We need people who are going to be sensitive to God because it's only in the place of serving that God builds your ministry. Don't you know that you won't be able to serve? No, let me say this. 
No one will be able to serve your ministry until you serve someone else's. Build my ministry, build my name. Whose ministry did you build? Whose business have you been building? Whose dream did you build that wasn't your own? Because you're not qualified for your own dream until you've built someone else's. What about Philip, man? Philip, this dude was so incredible. He knew the difference between the voice of an angel and the voice of God. Let me tell you what I mean. He's in a cave and said the angel of the Lord came to him and said, go out on the road. So when he walks out to the road, obeying the step God told him, on the road, then it says God comes to him and tells him, walk up to the carriage. So he was so sensitive to God's voice that he knew the difference of whether it was an angel or whether it was God himself. He walks up to the eunuch, he preaches the sermon, he baptizes the eunuch. The moment the eunuch comes out of the water, what happens? He's translated. He literally, 55 miles away, he shows up. It's like I'm right here and I'm gone. I'm 55 miles away on the spot. Why? Because Jesus didn't have time for him to walk the 55 miles to go and preach. He needed him to preach right now. And because Philip was on God's timeline, not his own, he was in the space God wanted him to be the time God wanted him to be. You see, if you'll submit to God's timing in your life, if you'll find out God's schedule and not your own, it could take you 10 months what it would take you 10 years. What was he doing? He was serving tables, waiting tables. Listen to what Exodus chapter 4 says. This is so incredible. Uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 through 2. It says that Moses is before God. We all know the story of Moses. He's hiding in the wilderness 40 years. Listen to what he does. It said that God comes to him in the burning bush and says, you're going to go and deliver all of my people. We're talking almost 3 million people, y'all. 3 million people. Now, Moses has this issue. He's got a stammer. He can't speak very well. So he's like, I can't. can't. That's how he's trying to talk to God. Can you imagine standing in front of God and you're like, you, 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 you can't send me. I, I I, I, I can't do it. I, I, and God responds. He doesn't even acknowledge his weakness. Oh, my God. Because God will not agree with you on the way you beat yourself up. God will not agree with you in the way that you minimize yourself. God never comes down to your level and agrees with what you say about yourself. So he comes and he says, no, you're going to deliver all my people. He said, but, 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 but I can't. But God says, yeah, 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 yeah. you're going to. Don't you know that God already knew that Moses had the stammer before he asked him? Can I ask you a question? Why do you keep giving these refusals to God? Don't you know he already knows what you've been through? Don't you know he already knows all your issues? Don't you know he already knows all your problems? And he's still calling you, so the choice is up to you. God knows what he's getting himself into. You don't have to remind him. Well, you don't know the place I was born. You don't know the house I was in. You don't know the neighborhood I came from. Man, if you saw my side of town, blah, blah, blah. Listen, God had an intention for everything he's done in your life. I know one thing. I don't know where you've been, but you're sitting in this building right now. <laughs> Some of y'all aren't shouting enough. I said, I don't know where you've been, but you're sitting in this building right now listening to me preach. So God must be on the throne. You see, y'all, for me, church is very simple. It's all about Jesus. I don't make it more complicated. You know why? Because when I was born, I had water inside of my lungs and my brain. I was mentally retarded. I was blind. I had muscle atrophy where literally I couldn't control my limbs. I had no vocal cord box for the first two years of my life. I slept inside of a glass crib because when I would cry, I would make no noise. My mother would have to see me. I was meant to be in a wheelchair for my entire life. I scientifically today am a human vegetable on paper, but I'm preaching to you today with a good, healthy vocal cord box. I'm walking around because of Jesus. <laughs> Listen, if all people get when they come and they encounter you is you, you're letting them down. You're not special just because you're you. God loves you because you're you. You're special because of the parts of Jesus that show out of you.
It's Jesus who's special. It's Jesus who's wonderful. It's Jesus who's mighty. It's Jesus that needs to be lifted up. It's Jesus that needs to be talked about. It's Jesus that needs to walk through our walk. It's Jesus that needs to be seen through our mouth. It's Jesus who needs to be seen through our action. It's Jesus. He's the one who changes the world. Don't you know? You're just a vessel he's using. Don't you get it? Your hands aren't supposed to belong to you. That's why you're not doing much is because you're still claiming these hands as your own. But once you give up these hands and Jesus takes over, these hands begin to do things you never thought they'd do because Jesus is now in control of these hands. Jesus is in control of these feet. You'll begin to say things that you don't. Where did that come from? I never even studied that. I don't even know how I know that. You know why? Because you gave up your mouth and Jesus took over and he knows everything. He knows how to say everything. He knows wisdom in every situation. Exodus 4 says this. God's in front of him. He says this incredible thing. This is so good. He says, Moses, you keep arguing with me. What is in your hand? And he looks at his hand and he has this stick. He's got this staff. He says, Lord, I got this stick. Do you know that not one miracle that happened when the frogs came down for Egypt, when the fire came down, when the river was turned into blood, when all of the boils popped out, all those things you hear in Exodus, not one of them happened until what happened? Moses had to first lift that stick. In other words, God never asks you for something you don't have. He always only wants you to give him what's already in your hand. Every single one of you have something in your hand right now. Are you a teacher? Do you write poetry? Do you have working hands? Can you build anything? Are you a fixer-upper guy? Are you somebody who has a mouth that can encourage? I don't know what you have, but I'm telling you this. If you want to find out your destiny, and this is what people ask me all the time, Gavin, how will I know what I'm called to? Am I a prophet? Am I evangelist? How do I know? How do I find out? And I always say this. Are you already giving to God what you already have? Because if you're not serving God with what is already in your hand, you'll never find out what was already in his heart before you were formed in your mother's womb. What is in your hand, church? Are you a single mother? Are you a father? What do you have? Do you have a car? Do you have five cars? Could you use any of those to pick up anybody and bring them to church? What do you have in your hand? And when is the day going to finally come when you begin to give over what you already have so God can finally show you what's always been in his heart? Matthew 25, 28, listen to these beautiful words. I think about Jesus. The Son of Man came not to be served, Chris, come on out, but to serve others and give his life it's a ransom for many. Do you know that the only man who ever walked the face of the earth that had the right to demand to be served was Jesus? But you know what he did? He said, let me show you what a leader really is. Let me show you what greatness actually is. Listen, I know when I say the word greatness, so many of you, your heart is pricked because you feel you've done nothing great with your life to this point. I know that feeling. I know the feeling. What have I done? God, what have I done that's great? What have I been a use for? I understand, please. But you have to know what God calls greatness. Jesus did not come to be served, but he came to serve and he gave his life. What a better service is that by giving your life? What, what could we have asked for that's any better than Jesus being a man who wasn't partly guilty? If he was partly guilty and we were guilty, it would have still been great. But he wasn't guilty of anything, y'all. He literally did nothing. And he gave his life for you. The Bible says before, while we were still yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. When you weren't looking for him, he was looking for you. When you weren't trying to seek him out, he was seeking you out. When you weren't calling on his name, he was already calling for you. Wherever you were, God was always looking for you because he's serving you. Matthew 20, 25 through 27. Jesus called them together and he said this. You know the rulers of this world, how they flaunt themselves and their authority, but you're going to be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must become your servant. Whoever wants to be the first among you must become your slave. 
Can I ask you a question? When is the last time that you truly examined yourself, husband? When's the last time you served your wife? When was the last time that you walked up and you didn't demand, well, you got to submit to me and the Bible says that, the Bible says that, and it's on me, but when's the last time? What can I do? I want to help. When was the last time, wife, that you said, I don't care about being right anymore? It doesn't matter that I win every argument. It doesn't matter that I make you feel like a fool. But when have you gotten down and said, how can I serve you? If we would have marriages, we would have a marriage revival. If every marriage would adopt the attitude of saying, how can I serve you? If we could outdo each other in serving, what could happen to our lives? When they said, Jesus, you're going to lead us all into a revolt. You're going to lead us in an army. You know what he did for the disciples? He pulled out a towel. He said, let me show you how I'm going to lead you. Sit down. Take your sandals off. Let me wash your feet. When is the last time you came to your child? Can I ask you? And you stop yelling and you stop bickering. I understand that you're only hearing obstinance. I understand you just feel it's all rebellion. I understand. When was the last time you got on your knees and said, God, you're going to have to help me. i got to understand my child. I don't know what's going on. I hate the way my house is right now. I hate it that we're yelling all the time. I, he's not feeling loved. He's not feeling loved. And I don't know how to do that. When's the last time you got on your knees? I said, I'm going to serve my kids. I want to understand you. When's the last time you called out to God to give you insight? How about God's wife, the bride of Christ? You see, every man in here, if I would talk bad about your wife, what would you do? You'd probably be ready to fight me. Why? Because she's yours. Because she belongs. Because you say, I'm going to protect what God has given me. I'm going to protect what God's doing. You wouldn't let anybody talk that way. But all of us almost allow God to talk, people to talk bad about God's wife. We allow people to talk bad about God's bride. When's the last time you protected her? When's the last time you came and you wiped her feet? When's the last time you came and you said, can I wash your feet? The bride of Christ. When's the last time you stopped treating her like a mistress and began treating her like a bride? You don't just visit her when she does something good for you. You don't just visit her when the music's the way you wanted it. You don't just use her because, wow, that sermon was good, so I'll tip you today, God. But when's the last time? She's the bride. When's the last time you served the bride? Every one of us want greatness, but very few of us want to serve our way to get there. Every eye closed, please. Every eye closed. I know the Spirit of God is moving on people's hearts right now. Jesus is inviting you. In just a moment, we're going to have a chance after the service today and the foyer for people to sign up for a place to serve. Please understand, we're not trying to make you a labor force for the church. We're giving you access to the bride in order to love and to serve her. And don't ever forget, the road to greatness is through service. If you want to know what God has called you to, if you want to know your service, it never happens apart from serving God's bride. I don't care if you say, man, I'm a handyman. That's all I got. I build things. We need it. I don't care if you say, man, I got money. We need it. I don't care if I'm just a father or mother. Maybe I could do something. You have no idea what God can use you to do if you'll just give him what is already in your hand. Would you examine your heart right now? Would you close your eyes and just between you and God ask, are you serving his church? Are you serving his bride? Have you given yourself for anything? Have you built and served anyone else's ministry even though you're believing for your own? What have you been serving? And is God asking you to give something else? Right now, before we do anything else, I want to ask if you know Jesus. If you say, Gavin, I have not known Jesus. I have to have peace with God. I need peace with God. It's so important to have peace with God because you can't buy it. You can't buy peace. You can't get more money and get peace. You can't get more women and get peace. You can't get more men. Nothing will bring you peace. 
except when God gives it to you himself through receiving Jesus Christ. Do you know him as your Lord and your Savior? Today is the time for commitment. If you say, Gavin, I need to know him. I want to have peace with God. I want to know without a shadow of a doubt that I know that me and God, we're together. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Lift your hand up all over this building saying, I want Jesus right now. Come on, lift your hand up. Look at these hands. Look at these hands. Look at these hands. Lift them up. Lift them up. Unashamed. Don't put them down. Don't put them down. Lift them up. Lift them up. There's more people lifting their hands. Lift them up. Stand to your feet right now if you're lifting your hands. Nobody else. Just the people standing. Stand to your feet if you're lifting your hands right now. Stand up. Stand up. Come on. Keep giving my hand. Stand up. If you just lifted your hands, stand up. Don't be ashamed. God is not ashamed of you. Listen. I don't know what brought you into this building. Maybe it was faithfulness because this is Pastor Marco has been your pastor forever. Maybe it was somebody who invited you to the service today. But Jesus is waiting for you right here. There's an encounter with God that he wanted you to have today. For some of you, it was very impactful to the place that you fought it. And other people, it was a seed that was planted in your mind that you will not be able to shake all week. Because I know that God spoke behind my voice. You see, it's not important what we necessarily even say. It's important that God says something. And I pray that all of you begin to hear the Lord speak today. We're going to pray for all of these people right now. And we're going to say this prayer out loud, every single person. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross, washing me with your blood, and making me new. I thank you for giving me a new life. Thank you for serving me. And now help me to serve you. In Jesus' name. Now, if you're standing up right now, could you come up to the front and pray with one of these people right now? They just want to meet you. They just want to meet you and pray with you. Come on. Come on. If you sat down, get back up. If you sat down, get back up and come up here. Come up here. Come up here. Come on. Look at these people. Look at these people. Help. They just want to meet you. They just want to talk to you. They want to give you a gift. They just want to give you a gift. Come on. Listen, right now, every other person, I'm going to be here on Wednesday night. Myself and my sax player back here, his name is Tammy Travel from Houston, Texas. We're going to be doing an incredible worship set for you this Wednesday night. We're going to have an extended time where the power of God's going to flow. I hope to see you on Wednesday. Besides that, right now, out in the foyer, there is a place for you to serve. I want you not to put this off. Where are you serving? If you're not, go do it now. We love you guys so much. God bless you and have a wonderful rest of your day.